It was the beginning of the first millennium BC. In the Indian subcontinent, great philosophic ideas, which were to last forever, were being crystallized. The material world which we see around us was considered Maya or Mithya, an illusion. The high purpose of life was to rise above these limitations, to lift the veils of illusion and to see beyond, thereby to break the spell of the transitory world or sansara. In this age, numerous thinkers gave up the attractions of the material world to search for the truth. They left behind their material possessions and their emotional bonds with their families. They sought to be free of the endless pursuit of desires in the material world. The greatest renunciator of the period was Gautama Siddhartha, known as the fourth or the seventh Buddha or enlightened one. Millions of his followers continue till today as one of the greatest religions of the world, Buddhism. Gautama Siddharth, born in the middle of the 6th century, was one of humanity's wisest teachers. He was the son of Sudhodana, the ruler of the Shakya clan. Sudhodana ruled from Kapila Vastu, which is in present-day Uttar Pradesh state. Gautama Siddharth was born in a grove of sal trees in Lumbini, which is in present-day Nepal. Ashoka, the great Indian emperor of the 3rd century BC, erected a pillar at Lumbini to commemorate this sacred site. Gautama lived the comfortable life of a prince. However, at the age of 29, his life took a different turn. He realized that all pleasures in life are transitory that all men must one day grow old, sick, and must die. He renounced his princely life and gave up his beloved family and home. For six years, Gautama wandered all over Bihar in his quest for true knowledge. He looked for teachers who may be able to show him the path of release from samsara the endless cycle of life and death in the illusory world. None were able to satisfy him. In the village of Uruvela, next to the Niranjana River, Gautama sat under a peepal tree to meditate. For days he sat in meditation. He was determined to find the truth. Mara and his armies attacked him from time to time. These are the personifications of our doubts, our confusions and our desires. However, he was unshaken in his meditation. He had resolved to escape the pains and confusions of the material world. It was a full moon night. Gautama sat under the peepal tree and continued his quest. Finally, his mind dispelled all the darkness of confusion. He had fully realized the truth of the cause of suffering in the world. He had seen the path towards happiness. After six years of struggle, Gautama attained his goal. He had become a Buddha, one who had gained bodhi, the knowledge of the truth. One man's glorious journey in search of enlightenment was successfully completed. In this, there was the beginning of a great journey for mankind. Gautama Buddha had resolved to preach what he had realized. At a deer park at Sarnath near Varanasi, the Buddha delivered his first sermon. This event is known as the Dharma Chakra Pravartan, or the setting into motion of the wheel of law. The Dhamek Stupa is said to stand at the exact place where the Buddha first preached in the deer park.
Emperor Ashoka of the 3rd century BC built many great stupas to honor the Buddha. He also erected many impressive pillars to commemorate events of the Buddha's life. The Ashoka pillar at Sarnath, with its famous capital of four lions, was erected at the place where the Buddha established his first Sangha, the Buddhist congregation. The Buddha frequently visited Rajgir, the capital of the kingdom of Magadha. He spent many monsoons preaching here. After he passed away, the first Buddhist council was convened at this site. Modern-day Rajgir preserves the remains of this ancient past. At the age of 80, Gautama Buddha headed towards Kushinagara in present-day Uttar Pradesh. There he told his close disciple Ananda that his end was near. Ananda was miserable and he cried bitterly. The Buddha told him not to grieve the loss of his master's transitory self. He said, Dharma is your refuge. At Kushinagara, Gautam Buddha attained Parinirvana, the final escape from the illusions of the material world. His followers divided his mortal relics and enshrined them in the heart of mud stupas which were made. Thus began a tradition which spread to many countries and continues till today. Later stupas house the remains of other great teachers, their personal belongings and also Buddhist texts. Thousands of stupas were made in the Buddhist tradition over the centuries. The stupa was a profound representation of the liberation from the bindings of the material world. In the 3rd century BC, Emperor Ashoka is believed to have retrieved the Buddha's holy relics and enshrined them again in stupas which he constructed across his kingdom. Archaeological excavations have shown that the core of the stupas at Sanchi and Amravati date back to Ashoka's period. However, building activity continued at these sites. What is visible today does not belong to the Mauryan period. The rule of the Mauryas was followed by that of the Shunga dynasty in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. The Shungas worshipped Hindu deities and were benevolent to the Buddhist Sangha. The earliest body of Buddhist art with images of the life of the Buddha and Jataka stories was made under their rule. The greatest surviving Buddhist stupa of the BC period is on top of a hill at Sanchi in central India. It is likely that it would have enshrined the relics of the Buddha. In the meantime, great caves were being carved out of the hills of the Ghats in Maharashtra in western India. Deep within the heart of the rock, the seeker was provided a haven of peace, far from the noise and the clamor of the material world. Over a period of about a thousand years, more than 800 Buddhist caves were hewn out of the heart of the rock. The first phase of prolific excavation was from the 2nd century BC till the 3rd century AD. The railings of stupas and the exteriors of caves 
presented images of the world as seen around us. Deep within the heart of the mountain, we were to contemplate that which was eternal, that which was within. The stupa was simplicity itself. In the silence of the interior, it was a symbolic representation of the escape from the illusions of the material world. The fertile valley of the Krishna River was the cradle of civilization in the Eastern Deccan. This area became one of the greatest centers of Buddhism and over 140 early Buddhist sites have been found in this region. Indeed, this river valley is a vast land of stupas and Buddhist caves. India has had an incredible history. For almost 2,000 years of known ancient history, there was no focus on individual persons, not even kings. It was the eternal truths, beyond the passing illusions of Maya or Mithya, which were the subject of Indian literature and art. In ancient India, homes and even palaces were made out of perishable materials like wood. It is only that which was made in the service of the eternal, which was made out of everlasting rock. In this vision, there were no portraits of kings, even though they were benevolent to all streams of spiritual thought. Buddhas or enlightened ones and Jain Tirthankaras were also not depicted. Only symbols of their achievement were made. It was not their personalities which were important. They were only a temporary illusion which would pass. It was the eternal ideas they represented which were the message of the art. The Kushana rulers who had come from Central Asia brought another outlook with them. In the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, they were the first kings in India to have portraits made of themselves. Near Mathura, as well as at their other capital at Peshawar, they built royal shrines with images of themselves. The cult of the worship of kings did not last beyond the rule of the Kushanas. However, in this period, a new focus came on the depiction of personalities in art. Images of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Jain Tirthankaras, Shiva, Vishnu, Kartikeya and other Hindu deities were created. Kushana coins present some of the earliest images of the Buddha. A Kushana coin also brings a very early image of Lord Shiva. The form in which the Buddha was presented was that of an enlightened being, one out of many, with 32 attributes that identified him as such. From the first century onwards, the portrayal of deities had become central to Indic art. These deities were the personifications of qualities. By meditating upon them, we awaken the best which is within us. By meditating upon the Buddha, we hope to awaken the Bodhi, or true knowledge, within us. By the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, very sophisticated images of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas were being created in the subcontinent. By the 5th century, sublime deities came to be made in central and northern India. Though they were in human form, their purpose was to move us 
through their grace and beauty, to transcend the world of forms, to leave behind our attachments and desires. The noble aim for the artist was to create the human form which rose above itself. It was not the human being who was caught in the web of the material world. It was an embodiment of that which was eternal, that which was still, undisturbed by turmoil and cravings. Meditating upon such a form, devotees awakened the best within themselves. They rose above the pains created by their own desires and confusion. In this period, the form was created to express that which is the spiritual state of the Buddha, one who has left behind the turbulence of the material world. Behind lowered eyelids, the look is within. In the mid-fifth century, under the rule of the Vakataka kings, the site of the Ajanta caves in Maharashtra saw renewed activity. The paintings and sculptures made in this period have a humanity and beauty which gives Ajanta a special place in Indian art. There is a grace and an inward look which is the hallmark of the art of this period. The Buddhist caves at Ellora in Maharashtra were made in the 7th century. These are the largest Buddhist excavations to be carried out in India. They also reflect developments in iconography which had been taking place. In early Buddhism, the responsibility of salvation lay entirely upon the individual and his own efforts to discipline himself. In time, compassionate beings or bodhisattvas were conceived. They delayed their own salvation to help all beings on the path. Followers could turn to them and pray to them for their help. This new branch of Buddhism soon had many followers. It began to call itself the Mahayana order of Buddhism. In the first century, the Kushana Emperor Kanishka held the fourth great Buddhist council in Kashmir. The site of Harwan, on a hill near Srinagar, is where the Great Council is believed to have been held. It was here that Sanskrit became the language of Buddhist scriptures instead of Pali, which was used before. In the 4th century in the Buddhist centers of Kashmir, the Yogacara school of thought was developed. It was believed that the most effective method for the attainment of the truth was through meditation or yoga, which means to become one with the eternal. In the 8th century in Kashmir, King Lalitaditya's capital, Parihaspura, was one of the great centers of Buddhism in the world. Magnificent stupas were built here by the king and by Chankuna, his Tokharian minister. Meanwhile, in the land of Magadha, in the eastern plains of India, great centers of Buddhist study came up. These had the bountiful support of Buddhist and Hindu kings of the region, and they developed into vast monastic universities. At these centers of learning, the message of the Buddha 
and his many qualities of wisdom and compassion were studied in great detail. Three of the best known Buddhist universities, Nalanda, Vikramshila and Udantapuri, were in eastern India in the region of present-day Bihar. In fact, Bihar derives its name from the many Viharas that flourished here. The greatest of these monastic centers was at Nalanda. It was a hub of learning where pilgrims and scholars came from all corners of Asia. At these great universities, the many qualities of Buddhahood within each of us and the steps on the path to enlightenment came to be studied in detail. The qualities which move us towards a realization of the truth were presented in a manner which left no room for ambiguity or doubt. This was Vajrayana Buddhism, the vehicle of the thunderbolt, whose logic was as clear and as striking as a clap of thunder. It was also as indestructible as a diamond. In earlier Buddhist thought, liberation was possible only through many lifetimes of effort. The Vajrayana offered the possibility of Nirvana within a single lifetime. At the heart of this system was the teacher-initiate relationship, where the seeker was guided by his teacher. Complex rituals, mantras or chants, and mudras or hand movements of Vajrayana Buddhism were codified in the form of tantras. Tantra literally means to carry on knowledge. It was in the Buddhist centers of Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Odisha, and Northeast India that the Vajrayana form of Buddhism was nurtured. Since early times, the kings of the Tibetan plateau turned with a great eagerness and zeal to India to imbibe the sacred faith of Buddhism. The Sanskrit script was taken to Tibet to form the basis of the Tibetan script which was created. In the 8th century, Shantarakshita from Nalanda University laid the foundations of a monastic order in Tibet. He also appealed to Guru Padmasambhava, also of Nalanda, to visit Tibet and to help enlighten the people about the new faith. Padmasambhava, who was teaching in Kashmir, brought with him the Cham, the monastic dance of the Lamas. The dance purifies the land and drives away all evil spirits. It also celebrates the victory of good over evil. Man's conquest over his ego which binds him to negative and worldly desires. The period of Guru Padmasambhava is known as the first great diffusion of Buddhism in the Indian Himalayas and Tibet. Till today, the Guru is the most revered teacher for all Buddhists in the region. In the 10th century, King Yeshe O came to the throne of Guge, which included Ladakh, Lohal Spiti, Kinnor and Western Tibet. By then, Buddhism had declined in the region. What troubled the king most was that even the little practice of the faith which continued was incorrect 
and full of local magical rites. King Yesheo sent Rinchen Zangpo and other scholars to Kashmir to bring back scriptures with the true knowledge of Buddhism. These were translated into Tibetan by Rinchen Zangpo, who became famed for all time to come as Lord Sava, or the Great Translator. Rinchen Zangpo continues to be deeply revered in the entire Himalayan region. King Yesheo and his successors made a chain of 108 monasteries across Guge. These were painted and sculpted by artists who were brought from Kashmir. This period is known as the second great diffusion of Buddhism in the Himalayas. These monasteries became the foundations of the Buddhist culture and art, which continues till today. The Cham dance of the Lamas in Ladakh and Spiti signifies the victory of knowledge over ignorance. In Buddhist thought, the greatest evil is the ego. It is that sense of the self which is the greatest illusion that we must lose in order to gain true knowledge. All humans are aware of the pain of life in this world. Thus, this philosophy of Buddhism was accepted with open arms wherever it traveled. The philosophy of Buddhism was accepted in the whole of Asia. It is a philosophy which looks always beyond the material aims of life to the eternal. Early Theravada Buddhism traveled in the 3rd century BC to Sri Lanka and then to Thailand, Laos and other countries of Southeast Asia. In the first millennium AD, Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism spread to China, Tibet, Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar and finally to Korea and Japan. This great culture of compassion shaped the vision of the continent. It is a culture of gentleness and peace, which continues till today. Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam 